There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Well, hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. It's Friday Reads. It's uh, overcast and, I don't know, temperatures feels like it might even be about 19. I'm a little cool in this t-shirt for the first time in a long time. It's a beautiful feeling. May it continue. So I have, despite what I'm about to tell you, two-thirds of which is negative in terms of finished and bailed and stuff, I have had a good week reading-wise, and that's because of the stuff that's ongoing, which I'm not going to tell you about. So just trust me on that, can ya? I have one bale. I don't think you're going to be too surprised this went into the trash or is going into the trash as soon as I finish filming this video. I read 55% of it and Ange is busy so she wasn't able to really join in but she bailed early. Britta's hate skimmed to the end. You can check out her Goodreads review where she told us that so I'm not telling tales of the school and I very relievedly bailed at the 55% mark. This was just a piece of poorly executed commercial fiction and without any literary, literarily redeeming features and stock characters and I would say borderline racist treatment of its African-American characters. So, blech. I will talk more positively about this book, which I finally finished yesterday, Tantuan Eng's The Garden of Evening Mists, uh, shortlisted for the Booker in 2015. I enjoyed it. The, the main reason I'm not going to do a separate review for this is because I put it aside for two months. I see I started this in May. <laughs> it's September, so yeah, I put it aside for two months and read it very slowly, and sometimes I do a full review anyway, but no, I can't, I can't do this justice because... Uh, I want to say there was a problem with pacing. Well, when you put a book down for two months, you can't really, you don't have much credibility. It was a four-star read for me. I learned a lot about various Asian cultures in a way that I didn't resent. Sometimes if I'm always having to go to Google and stuff, that's not a positive experience. Here it was. Malaya culture and the, uh, that part of Asia and what it went through during and after the war, a bunch of stuff that I didn't know very much or anything about that I needed to check out as I was reading it. And for the most part, that was a very positive experience. I thought the writing was really good, very descriptive. If you're interested in Japanese gardens, you will just, this is a book gasm for you. And I am not into gardening, but I thought those descriptions and that, all the stuff that I needed to check, borrowed scenery to uh, experience this book as fully as possible. That was really positive for me. And also about trauma. The main character, a Chinese Malayan woman, had been a, in the prison camp during the Japanese occupation. And she keeps it a secret from all everybody around her and us, the reader, until very late in the book. And when you when I got to that point it did really pack a punch and it was really a story of how she what she needed to do in order to heal and what she had to realize she could never heal and would never be able to do so she couldn't heal all of those questions were explored fascinatingly I would say that I didn't get as inside of the characters even her as I would have liked her primary relationship in this novel is with a gardener who used to be the gardener for the Japanese emperor and then went to Malaya before the war and she meets him after the war and it's the central relationship of the book and I thought it was a very cold relationship he was very remote he was fit a lot of the stereotypes of typical Japanese man not including Kenji very remote and not emotionally expressive and that made for a very cool narrative at times, but I didn't warm to some of this as much as I felt I should have. It kind of reminded me of uh, Amanata Forna's happiness. So if you didn't think that book had flaws, that you felt that the characters were close enough to you and that you were deep inside this story, which I didn't, then you, you might like this book even better. And I know Britta loved, quite liked or loved happiness, and I think, Britta, this would be a book for you. 
I enjoyed this more than happiness, and I'm, the, the comparison and contrast between happiness and this book stops now, but uh, it was a little bit remote in places for me. It also brought in a lot of storylines in the last fifth of the book that I thought, oh, you know what, I've got enough. It, it's, it's almost borderline cluttered with plot. So it's a very plotty novel. So again, this is a Brita book. This is not your own personal Friday Reads Brita, but if you haven't read it, according to Goodreads, I don't think so. I think you would like it, and I think a lot of others of you. I'm, I'm so glad I read it, and I would definitely try more by this author. After the group bail slash hate read of The Gypsy Moth Summer, Britta and I picked up another book that we could quickly find, a short book that we could quickly buddy read on Scribd. An American novel about a 18th century lesbian couple from Ireland living in Wales. So, can you get your head around that? The novel is called The Ladies, and the author is Doris Grumbach, and I was delighted and surprised to discover she's still alive. She turned 101 in this summer. An American lesbian novelist. This novel, I believe, was published in the 1980s. The pronunciation of their... Clan Gotland. They were known as the Ladies of Langolin, which is how a stupid English speaker with no knowledge of Wales or Welsh pronunciation would say it, and I think I'm going to stick with it, because the other one that I found, Clan Godlin, and I, I just didn't take the time to do any more research, so I'm just going to continue to massacre it the way it would read to it, an Anglo pronouncer, Langolin, the Ladies of Langolin. And they were Eleanor Butler and Sarah Ponsonby. Uh, Eleanor Butler was uh, from the nobility, and Sarah Ponsonby was not quite the nobility. They were from around the Kilkenny, in the Kilkenny area of Ireland, and they fell in love, and they eloped was the term that they used to Wales, and built a life there, and became known as eccentrics, and were quite popular and famous, but also, you know, made fun of or vilified in a, in a certain way object of curiosity and were friends of all the famous people like Wordsworth and so on. I didn't like the novel, I didn't think it was any good, but the story is very interesting. So Britta has a much more refined uh, critique of it and I hope that you might get a chance to hear that on her channel, but maybe not, I don't know. Mine is blunt, which is oh, I would have rather have just read the Wikipedia article. <clears throat> and I didn't, I mean I've heard of the Ladies of Langland over the years, but I didn't read it because I wanted to try to sink into a fictionalized version of their life. And by the end, I thought there was no real point to that. I would have rather read a full-length 200-page biography of them or just the Wikipedia article for the facts because there was nothing added to the facts that made it a rewarding fictional experience for this particular reader. They were eccentric. They were not nice people. They were deeply fascinating, and lots of famous people kept coming and going from their house. And I don't know how she managed to make all that sound mundane, but for me, by the end, it seemed rather pointless. Read the Wikipedia article. Three stars. So that's what I finished. I started, I've got a bear start on this, uh, Sanjeev Sahota's debut novel, Ours Are the Streets published in 2011. I'm enjoying it. I'm just about 30 pages in. Yeah, just reading 10 pages a day so far. I'm going to pick up the pace a lot now that I've uh, cleared some stuff off my roster. I can see already it's it's very much a first novel. I have no critique. I have nothing so far, nothing I, that I would criticize. It's just a reading like, you know, the typical debut. It's first person narrative. I don't think, I don't know how autobiographical it is, but not very because it's kind of the confessions of a suicide bomber the night before he launches his attack in the UK and it's about his life and it starts out the retrospective starts out very lightheartedly about a young Muslim man in UK falling in love and great sense of humor so it's gonna trace that trajectory and the moral ferocity of Sahota's next novel, The Year of the Runaways, makes me trust where this is going completely. 
so far so good so this is a short and sweet Friday reads so maybe I'll do some video shout outs at the end Ooh, hoo, hoo. Um, Tuesday September 24th is the beginning of the first month of gone with a book my book recommendations video went up about a week ago and my TBR video will go up tomorrow for gone with a book this is a readathon put on by Mel of Mel's Bookland Adventure to celebrate and read pre-1950 20th century fiction from anywhere in the world and by any gender that you can find. The last seven days of each of September, October, and November, just the last week. So the first week, it starts next week. So I'm going to try my very first Ivy Compton Burnett novel, which was published in 1930. And it is called Men and Wives, and it's about kind of a matriarch of a family who is a bit domineering. The epitome of the maternal power figure. Oh my. It's an ebook on script, so I have never tried Abby Compton Burnett. She was a contemporary of Barbara Pym's, but she was an old lady by the time Barbara Pym started writing, but she's always struck me as somebody. She seems very odd and severe, and I want, and her writing. Apparently her prose is very unique, <laughs> not necessarily for everybody, so I'm going to find out if it's for me. I am also probably going to try a short novella by Ronald Furbank, if I can squeeze it in next week as well, uh, concerning the eccentricities of Cardinal Pirelli. Because for nonfiction November, I'm thinking of reading a mammoth biography of Ronald Furbank, a gay writer from the early 20th century. But if I don't like any of his fiction, which I've never tried, uh, I don't think I'll bother. So I'll try an 83-page novella or glorified short story by him. Uh, he was a piece of work, but uh, I'm not sure that his writing will be for me. So let's find out, shall we? So those two for Gone with a Book, my TBR of my other reading plans and pile of possibilities will be up tomorrow. I am also planning to start the next of the Faber stories, John McGairn's The Country Funeral. Mr. McGairn, please save me from panning this entire series. So much of these have been awful. Surely you will restore my faith in the short story, Mr. McGairn. I have not read anything this man has written, so really stoked. Nice segue to another Irish writer. Brian of Bookish and I will read the second novella in this collection, Two Lives, and that novella is My House in Umbria. We read a couple of months ago, we read the first one, reading Turgenev, and really, really liked it a lot. I loved it. So, fingers crossed that the second one will be uh, at least nearly as successful. So, that's my uh, reading for next week. I have a whole bunch of stuff still in progress. But all of that is going to start next Tuesday, so this is Friday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. i got four days to, to finish up as much of what's currently in progress as possible. And then hit the ground running Tuesday with what I've just shown you. And then next week is Victober! I am so excited! Oh my god! You know, and I think... I love... Victober is probably the most successful of all the readathons last year, and I thought, why didn't I just keep reading Victorian stuff throughout the year? But the the, the anticipation of just focusing 98% on Victorian literature this October, it's just, it's like Christmas for me. So my TBR for that will go up Sunday or Monday. Ah, yeah, life is beautiful. Oh, let's see what's on BookTube that I might watch later today, shall we? These are videos that I have not seen. Jacqueline of Six Minutes for Me has a review of a, I'm assuming it's an, yeah, an Australian novel. This Taste for Silence by Amanda O'Callaghan. Julia of Julia's Book Time, a new channel that I'm just getting to know, and it's, she's wonderful. She's an Australian woman too. And she does great vlogs, and the, the, the way that she multitasks with her beautiful little baby strapped on her person is just a, a, a joy and a wonder to behold and she has a reading wrap up from the same readings prize shortlist that I believe Jacqueline is reading her way through. Another new channel that I want to shout out is uh, Kathy of Grim Reads. 
very new to booktube she's been a booktube consumer booktube commenter for quite some time and she has done the booktube new me tag she promised me she was going to do it tipsy but she she didn't but it should i'm still looking forward to watching it alex of what page are you on has already got his victober tbr up the spine breakers have a backwards book title challenge i want to check that out Nashua says she's failing at reading, at least that's the title of her video. I'm sure she's being too hard on herself. And I'm going to shout out Bookish's Poetry for Beginner series, even though I'm so surprised I've never looked at it because I just am not interested in poetry. But if you are, I'm sure it's wonderful because everything I've ever watched on Bookish's channel is wonderful. And this one is on Edmund Spencer. The last shout out I want to give is, and I'm not alone in extolling his interestingness and uh, you must subscribe to this person-ness. Jason Harrigan has been pumping out the videos. He's trying to give Steve Donahue a run for his money. So he had two videos come out at the same time last night. One is a, was a great book haul with an with a, a incredible piece of A.A. Uh, Milne memorabilia collectible thingy and then at the same time military manuals of brief overview this man has got his finger in a lot of literary pies I tell you all right that's it thanks for watching